Uh, good evening, young people. Today we're going to be talking about um, our beginning lecture on gas laws. We're going to be talking about pressure, temperature, kinetic molecular theory beginnings. We're going to come back to this topic. So here we go. I'm taking my face away, by the way. So some random thoughts. We live immersed in a gaseous solution. All the time, we're in a gaseous solution. We live at the bottom of an ocean of air. That's a constant. And finally, pressure goes from high to low. So pressure is never going to go from low to high. It's always going to go from high to low. That's just a fact of matter. It's kind of like heat. Heat goes from hot to cool. It never goes from cool to hot. So it's the same concept with a different pattern. Okay. So what are some properties of gases that we need to know about? Only four quantities are needed to define the state of a gas. So in other words, if we want to know that something's a gas, we have to know something about these four quantities. What are they? The quantity of the gas, N, is the letter that we use, and that is in number of moles. Next is the temperature of gas, um, T, in Kelvin. Notice it's not in Celsius, and that is because Celsius has negative temperatures, and we can't have negative numbers here. We can't have negative volumes. We can't have negative pressures. I mean, the lowest we go in volume is zero. The lowest we go in pressure is zero. So we've got to make sure that we have a temperature scale that accommodates for that, and Kelvin does. Then we have volume of gas, V, always in liters, and pressure of gas, usually in atmospheres, but not required. We'll talk about that in just a few minutes. Okay, a gas uniformly fills any container that it occupies. It's going to fill the entire container. That's what a gas is. Unlike a liquid that fills only part of the container or a solid that only occupies the space that the solid occupies, a gas will completely and totally fill the container and completely cover it all. It's also easily compressed. In other words, I can put a lot of gas into something as long as it can handle the pressure. I can get more and more gas in there. And I can compress it down further and further and further. Um, until the point at which it either turns into a liquid or the can is just overpressurized and explodes. And it mixes completely with any other gas. So if I mix two gases together, eventually all those gases will be indistinguishable and they will be completely mixed together. A vapor, however, is a substance that is usually a liquid at room temperature and that has formed a gas because of something that's going on. For example, a gasoline vapor. I mention this because sometimes we talk about water vapor. Yes, water is a vapor because water, usually at room temperature, is a liquid. Therefore, when water turns into steam, we can call it water vapor. However, we couldn't say oxygen vapor because oxygen at room temperature is a gas. So we would call that a gas. Um, so things that are room temperature, uh, liquids at room temperature, we call vapors when they turn into gases. And things that are gases at room temperature, we just call gases. And so it's just a way to distinguish a little bit of a property about those things. And we will be dealing with something called vapor pressure in one of our labs. Pressure defined. Gas pressure is the measure of the force that the gas exerts on its container. Force is a physical quantity that interferes with inertia. So force is anything that stops motion or or put something into motion. So it either stops it being solid or stationary and puts it into motion, or it stops the motion and makes it stationary. That's what a force is. Gravity is this force responsible for weight. So anything pushing down on us gives us weight. That's the force responsible for weight. So force, Newton's second law says that force is equal to mass times acceleration. And the SI unit is as follows. Newtons, N, is equal to kilograms, which is the unit of mass, that's the SI unit, and meters per second squared, which is the unit of acceleration, that's SI unit. So N is equal to what we call a Newton, giving credence to the guy who came up with three laws that talk about force. Okay, pressure, on the other hand, is force per unit area. It's not about force. It's about the force you can put on an, an area that you have on. Think of a bed of nails. Why can you lay on a bed of nails and not get hurt, but if you step on a single nail, it will go through your shoe and through your foot sometimes if it's sharp enough. And that is because the bed of nails, there are more nails covering the surface area, and so each nail is only covering part of your surface, whereas when you step on a single nail, all of your force is being put on that, whereas your force is being distributed over the bed of nails instead of just a single nail. If you laid on a single nail, that nail is going to go through you, and it will hurt. So we have Newton meter squares for the unit. The SI unit, however, is a little different. It's a Pascal, and that is equal to, guess what? A Newton meter squared. 
So PA is Pascal, and we'll talk about a Pascal in just a few minutes. So if we look at this, we can see that the gas is moving. How do we know that the gas is moving? Well, if we look at the diagram, we see the little, um, the little uh, like shadows. Those shadows are indicating that there's motion going on. We can also see that some particles are further away. They have longer motion lines, longer. We would draw arrows to show motion. Um, and those are telling us that we have gaseous molecules at all kinds of different energies. But the moment that gas molecule hits the surface of the container, it creates pressure. And so pressure can be defined because of that. So when a gas molecule hits the surface of the container, it creates a pressure, and that's where the pressure comes in. So if we have a lower pressure, so let's say we're at room temperature, we've got a container that has gas in it, it's at a lower pressure when there are fewer number of particles, but it's at a higher pressure when we have higher number of particles. So the density of the gas gives you a lower or a higher pressure. So lower density gases give you lower pressure. Higher density gases give you higher pressure. So what instrument uh, measures pressure? Well, a barometer was invented by M Evangelista Torricelli in 1643. It uses the height of a column of mercury to measure gas pressure, especially atmospheric pressure. When you see a big P, you always think pressure. We get a couple of units from this, and that is millimeters of mercury and tor. Tor, actually named after Torricelli, the man who invented the barometer. Millimeters of mercury because literally you're measuring millimeters of mercury. And so when it all came out to it, one millimeter mercury is equal to one tor. So here is a barometer, a, a typical mercury barometer. We don't see mercury barometers very much anymore because you can't have mercury out open like that. So you have a pool of mercury, you have an evacuated vacuum, uh, a vacuum sealed glass tube that has a vacuum in it, and the mercury begins to rise or fall depending on how the atmospheric pressure pushes onto the surface of the mercury. And then we measure the amount of the column in the vacuum tube and that tells us what the pressure is. So we see 760 millimeters, which is the same thing as 29.92 inches of mercury. <coughs> Excuse me. So barometers can also look like this. I actually have one of these at home. Um, and it is a water barometer. So it doesn't use mercury, but it's the same concept. So you have this flask that has just air in it. It's just air because I filled it up with air in it. And then you have this tubing right here that also has air coming down it. And so what ends up happening is the change in pressure inside that flask will tell us what's going on. So is this high pressure or low pressure? What's the pressure of the air? What's the pressure of the gas inside the container? And all of that has to do with, because remember, the gas inside the container is trapped. It's essentially air, but it's trapped air, okay? So the gas inside, the outside air pressure. Here we go. So what do we know? If we have a difference, if the pressure of the gas inside is lower than the pressure of the air on the outside, we take a difference of that. And that is low pressure. That means the pressure, the air pressure outside is less than the pressure of the gas on the inside. And so the outside is losing the push with the inside. So that means the pressure of the gas is the pressure of the air plus the height difference. Okay, pretty simple. Okay, so here we wouldn't have numbers. We would know the pressure of the air and we would add the height difference and that would give us the pressure of the gas inside. So this would be high pressure gas inside, low pressure air outside. So how about this one? It's a little different, isn't it? We can see that the air outside has pushed the water level down here and it's lower than the level of the water inside the, the, the uh, globe. So what does that mean? High pressure, the outside is winning. The push against the inside, meaning that the gas inside is lower pressure than the air outside. Therefore, the column of water on that on the other side where the little handle is and the globe are gonna be different. So that means the pressure of the gas is the pressure of the air minus the height. So this one is a little different because there's not really a scale and you'd have to know what the air pressure is being measured at on that day and then measure the difference to be able to do this. So a problem here. On a certain day, a barometer indicates that the atmospheric pressure is 767.4 torr. 
A sample of gas is placed in an open end and mercury manometer, and we'll talk about a manometer in just a second. A meter stick is used to measure the height of the mercury above the bottom of the manometer. The level of the mercury in the open arm of the manometer has a measured height of 136.4 millimeters, and that in the arm that is in contact with the gas has a height of 103.8 millimeters. What is the pressure of gas in atmospheres and in kPa? So I want you to try to solve this problem, and we're going to talk about this one tomorrow when we come back to class. Okay, so let's try to solve these problems, and we're going to talk about them tomorrow when we come back to class. This has to do with the idea that we just talked about in the barometer and understanding what's going on, and you need some more information about a manometer, and I'm sorry that I messed that up, and I should have put it a little bit later. Okay, standard units of pressure. Here we go. One atmosphere is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury, which is equal to 760 torr, which is equal to 29.92 inches of mercury, which is equal to 14.7 psi, pounds per square inch, which is equal to 101.325 kPa, which is equal to 101,325 pA. Pascals, pA, Pascals are really, really tiny. So when we think about a Newton meter squared, that's a really tiny unit. And so we have to have 101,325 Pascals to be normal atmospheric pressure. We don't use Pascals very much in this class. We, typically, we stick to atmospheres, millimeters of mercury, tor. Every once in a while, you'll see inches of mercury, maybe even PSI if we're trying to throw something in from the real world. But typically, those are the ones we see. But what this provides us with is now we can do dimensional analysis. We can convert between the units. We have equalities between all of these units. These are going to be some really important things to understand and know. So at sea level, all of the above are defined as standard pressure. So one atmosphere is standard pressure. 760 millimeters mercury, standard pressure. 101.325 kPa, standard pressure. So all of those things are standardized now. So the SI unit of pressure, though, is the Pascal, and it was named after Blasé Pascal, who was French. Yeah, 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 he's French. It's all good. The French did a lot of things in the name of science um, a long time ago. So we understand that one Pascal is one newton meter squared. We already kind of figured that out, and we understand that a Pascal is quite small. So we have to be aware that a Pascal is quite small. So a manometer. Here's the piece that you're going to need to know here. So a manometer is a device for measuring the pressure of a gas inside of a container. So the pressure of the gas is given by H, the difference in mercury levels in units of torr equivalent to millimeters of mercury. So we have to understand that it's given by changes in H. And so we're going to understand that in just a second. So let's look at a manometer. So these are both open-ended manometers. This is an open-ended manometer. And we can see that the gas pressure inside yeah, the, the, the height is higher on the gas side than it is on the air side, which means that the air pressure is winning. So how do we calculate that? Well, that would mean that the gas pressure is equal to the atmospheric pressure outside minus the height of the column, so the difference in the height. Everybody got that? So if the air pressure is winning, then the gas pressure is minus the height, atmospheric minus the height. So let's look at another one. Here we have one where the atmospheric pressure is losing. The gas is winning. And so how do we figure out the pressure? Very similar to the barometer. It's a very similar situation as the barometer that we talked about before. This would be the gas pressure is equal to the atmospheric pressure plus the height. So if the air pressure is losing, we have to add that height to the atmospheric pressure. If the air pressure is winning, then we have to subtract that height from there. Okay, so exercise one. A pressure of gas is measured at 49 torr. Represent this pressure in both atmospheres and pascals. Again, this is going to be a problem that I want you to do on your own, and I want you to bring it back to class tomorrow to talk about. Okay? And then finally, comparison here. Rank the following pressures in decreasing order of magnitude. Uh, first, largest is first, and the smallest is last. Again, this is another problem that I want you to bring back with you to class. Yeah, my husband just walked in. He just picked up dinner. Wonderful guy. Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit about the kinetic molecular theory. This is just the beginning of it. This is just the definition, just to get used to it, because we're going to be talking about this so much when we talk about defining state and we talk about defining things. 
So first of all, this is a model. And there are a lot of assumptions that are made in every model that we use. And this model is no different. So here are the four assumptions that are made in this model. First, all particles are in constant random motion. Okay, so all particles are always moving all the time and we can't predict where they're gonna be. It's constant, if they're in motion and it's random. We don't know what's happening. Two, all collisions between the particles are perfectly elastic. I'm gonna explain what elastic means. For some of you in physics right now, you already know what elastic means. And three, the volume of the particles in a gas is negligible. In other words, the actual particle of gas has no, no real volume. We're just talking about the volume of the container. The gas, we don't consider volume, okay? And finally, the average kinetic energy of the molecules is equal to the Kelvin temperature. So these are four assumptions that we have to make for this model to work for us. And in all honesty, it works really, really well to predict a whole lot of things. So what is elastic versus inelastic? Elastic collisions are when two things hit each other and they bounce away without sticking. An inelastic collision is when they bounce together and they stick together. So if you think about billiard balls, two billiard balls bouncing together will bounce back off once they hit each other and go in different directions than they were. But if you have two motor vehicles in a crash, sometimes those two motor vehicles will hit and deform enough and catch and go away together. Um, so it just really depends on the type of collision. But we are always assuming inelastic collisions here. So this theory neglects any intermolecular forces. So we're not going to be talking about intermolecular forces when we talk about kinetic molecular theory. And it's important to also know that the gases expand to fill their containers, but solids and liquids do not. They do not fill their entire container, but gases will always fill the entire container. And gases are compressible. Solids and liquids are not really compressible. We cannot get solids and liquids any smaller than what they are, but gases we definitely can. So hopefully this helps you with everything that you need, and I'll see you tomorrow with the answers to those three questions.